I think I'd like to go straight into the questioning. It's really um, a pleasure to be here with, with Maria. Um, uh, partly we'll be talking about uh, the book In Memory of Memory, um, uh, but I think that the conversation will go beyond that as well, um, partly because I, I one of the advantages of moderation is you can ask the questions that you want to ask, and um, and some of that will be adjacent to this particular book. Um, I remember when this came out, um, for those who don't aren't familiar with it, well, actually, this is a question about genre and 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 the tricky status of genre with this book, so maybe I don't need to explain it at all. Um, the German edition, for example, there was this question of how to actually market the book. Or even in the English language edition, you'll see here that this is the UK one, and this particular publisher, if it's a work of fiction, they would do it in blue, and if it's a work of nonfiction, then they do it in white. And in fact, there was a large discussion about what kind of color to use for this because of the nature of the book. It's not quite a memoir, even though you are talking about family history and you do talk about yourself. It's not, as the Germans claim, metafiction, whatever that's supposed to mean. That's a publicist, I assume, somewhere who has to write something up. Um, but I wonder if you could say something about uh, what this was to you at least in terms of form, because you're sensitive to form. I don't think this was a question of just throwing anything down on the paper. It certainly draws on the essay as a form of kind of discursive examination, you know, um, analysis. Uh, uh, there are philosophical elements in the kinds of attention that you draw to objects. There's a deep engagement with history, Russian history, Jewish history, other forms as well, and of course family history, which is an important part to it, and literary history. Um, of course, when you're writing a book, you don't have to decide what kind of book it is, but once it enters the world, uh, you have to encounter the expectations of others. Can you s did you think of this initially as a form of autobiography? I suppose maybe if before the book existed, what did you imagine it as? Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Uh, is it? Are you able to hear me? Okay. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, well, spending an evening in Paris, uh, listening to to literary conversation. That's uh, well. It means a lot. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, <coughs> well, the actual question is uh, well. What did I? How did I imagine the book? What, did, what I was trying to do at the very beginning? And uh, I have a confession. Uh, at the very beginning, I didn't think about the audience at all. Or maybe I was imagining a different kind of an audience. Um, I had uh, a long uh, developed plan or maybe an obsession. I always knew, since I was a 10-year-old, that I'm going to write a book about my family. Uh, and uh, I even made uh, a first approach when I was 10 or 12. And I have, uh, well, some evidence, a school notebook where I was writing the first pages of what had later become uh, In Memory of Memory in my, well, school kids' handwriting. And then I had to postpone the whole endeavor, of course. And at the moment when I was finally ready to, to start researching at least, I was more than 40. And all this enormous familial structure around me, it was uh, practically wiped out. There was no one uh, to ask all the possible questions. I did remember a bunch of stories that my mother used to tell me when, when I was a child. And I had an, uh, also an enormous familial archive with lots of black and white photographs and postcards and letters and memorabilia. But I couldn't exactly connect the dots. I couldn't... Uh <coughs> so you're having a story, for instance, about a person from the early 20th century who was a gambler and uh, he was so much into it that at some point he sold his university diploma to be able to, to make a gamble. Uh, but uh, in the family photo albums, there is 
a lot of, well, black and white, mustached persons that might be this human being, but uh, maybe not. You never know if this was that Uncle Busia who was so, well, arrogant and interesting. Maybe it was another person, maybe not even a relative, but just a person. So I understood that I have nothing palpable and uh, nothing that I could tell in this straightforward linear way, in the mood of, uh, uh, of uh, regular storytelling. You are starting at the point A and then uh, maybe making some digressions or, s yeah, you're arriving somewhere, but not in this case. And uh, so my idea was uh, not to get somewhere, not finding the point B, but creating a structure that would be different from a regular novelistic structure or from a regular essay book. It would be an open space something of an exhibition space maybe, that the reader might be entering from every single point, as well as you might be opening a poetry book. You're just you know, opening, up, opening it up on any single page and diving in. And you can go forward, you can leave back for 20 or something, 20 or 30 pages. It is an open space, an open place, a common place uh, where Everything and everyone is welcome. So in a way, I never asked myself about the genre definitions or the genre possibilities. And so this book is a travel book because I had to visit all the places, a number of places all across Europe where my relatives used to live in the late 19th century and so on. And um, it is... Uh, a family book, a memoir of sorts, and uh, in a way it is uh, mm, what the Germans call the Bildungsroman, uh, a story of a young person developing, and uh, thus it is my own story because uh, I never arrived anywhere, but I was developing and changing while writing this book. It is, and maybe at the beginning and at the end of it, it is primarily a love story, but a sort of a backwards, a love story facing back, uh, because all the love I was capable for was addressed to the people that were not able to love me back, not able to read the book I was writing about them, not able to receive this homage, and uh, so I was addressing the dead, mainly and primarily. And uh, maybe that's why the book turned out to be mm, sort of strange. I was struggling to find a, a right genre for it. And in the Russian edition, um, the subtitle is Romance, which is uniting different things. Uh, in Russia, romance is uh, mainly a song, uh, a lead, in and uh, I was also thinking about the Freudian uh, family roman or family romance, a person that is inventing at a certain stage of her development. She's inventing an imaginary family, trying to replace her own obvious and ordinary story with something grand and romantic. And uh, still mainly, it is a love story. So it is a, uh, this uh, romance, uh, a love story, a uh, uh, story of a doomed love in a pink cover in the French edition, which feels quite suitable. Although, to, in defense of the publisher, every book they do is in pink if it's foreign. But um, that's... Uh, but I'm thinking with you, the, the romance is an interesting kind of category. Um, also, I associate the romance with, with fiction making, with the novel. And what's interesting about the book is precisely what you mentioned earlier, is actually the negative space in this book. There are families, I've read memoirs, um, in which 
you have rich documentation of 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 one's ancestors, or we, the reader encounters, a, you know, a well document. Maybe, maybe there's a grandfather who is a writer, or there are diaries, or there are extensive, you know, uh, written texts. It's, yeah, uh, there's a trail that can be followed. This book is interesting, and perhaps romance is also appropriate because of its fictional component, because so much is missing. And the missing, the negative space, the things that you don't know about the members of the family, the things that are purely speculative and speculated in the process of writing the text, at least this is the way it seems to me while reading, um, becomes one of the themes of the book. Um, and it reminds me in some way of, of uh, the subtitle for an autobiography or a form of autobiography, which is in fact also family history that Marina Warner um, published, I think, last year. Uh, it, was, it was called Inventory of a Life Mislaid, uh, which is useful because of its notion of inventory. And what you often are using in here are different kinds of documents, which is what you have in the end. Um, perhaps not the kinds of documents that would make for a great novel because they lack the detail and the stories, um, and it's you confronting them in here. But um, but this, the, the subtitle to The Warner was An Unreliable Memoir, and that seems to me something uh, in sync with, with an o a consciousness, with the awareness of, of what you're doing here. Um, that is to say, that working with fragments, at least in terms of family history, some photographs, some letters, um, there's a very memorable sequence of letters uh, written during the siege of Leningrad, uh, for example. And that's a, what it's a cousin of the grandfather or of grandmother. Grandfather, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. um, the letters themselves don't actually document for somebody who's not in the family very much, right? And there's some basic things about war that, that you can gather from it. You can. It's, it's, as you say, the melancholy is between it. Um, this is not a question. I suppose this is a response. Is, is the response to the way that um, it's fascinating to me, the way the book is, 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 is dealing so much with what's missing, and that that missing aspect of it becomes an important component to, to the story that's being told, um, along with, and this, the a certain kind of apprehension about telling it um, when you call something unreliable when you talk about the problems of of of, of presenting this as a narrative um, which is that's present that's explicit in your writing um, that seems to take this into account the 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 the, the limitations of 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 what it can actually recount. Mm -hmm. I think it is actually more than limitation. It is an um, impossibility, or maybe a number of different uh, in impossibilities. Any person who is writing a memoir or a historical book nowadays is, mm, we have to face it, uh, to start with the fact that uh, no narrator is reliable nowadays. And uh, I know this from my own story because uh, in my family there was a number of grand storytellers. My mother in the first place who was always telling me uh, the bedtime story that had something to do with the grand old times and uh, the unbelievable women who lived in the revolutionary times. I do want to talk about Sarah Ginsburg at some point because we are in Paris. And yes, that, that, that we'll, we'll, we'll move there. Actually, I've been at the place. That is my great-grandmother who used to live in Paris in the beginning of the century uh, studying medicine. And she was living at Rue Bertolet. And I was there a couple of weeks ago to, to say hello. The, the building is obviously still there. But uh, the problem is you are having a person, a storyteller in the family. Uh, usually it is a female because uh, that, is, uh, mm, the, the, that is something I, uh, I tend to think about modes and ways of uh, transmitting this familial memory. Uh, women are talking, 
telling stories, chatting at the kitchen table. And when men had experienced something, either they are keeping silent or they are putting things down in order to leave them for the further generations. They are never addressing their contemporaries and never their immediate families. And that is striking. But uh, when we come to this uh, uh, women and the stories they are telling, of course they were hiding something, omitting something, replacing one story with another for the purpose of pure safety. Or maybe they were trying to forget certain things. And uh, so any story a person knows about herself in the middle of, well, at the, at the end of the 20th century, in the beginning of the 21st century, is something that was heavily edited. It has nothing to do with the truth. It is, in the best possible case, it is wishful thinking. But sometimes the omissions were intentional. So we don't know what exactly happened back then. And sometimes you're able to find some facts, some documents that would be uh, contradicting the established narrative. But still you see that some serious details are still lacking. The puzzle is not to be solved. And uh, that is the main problem. In my, in, in my, from my point of view, every human being nowadays is a survivor of the 20th century because we are the children and grandchildren of those who didn't perish. And it means that our stories, not only we are living in the space that would be, that would belong to someone else, if not for the catastrophes of the century, uh, but also the details and the sense of connection that our parents could give us. Good, uh, could give over to us. Mm, it is faulty by definition. You always having, you're always having some, some bits and pieces missing, and all the efforts are just leading us to this understanding. You are unable to put all the things together, and that is the first impossibility. And the second one, and it is very important for me. Um, I have serious problems with the concept of things being interesting. Something uh, you've mentioned um, at the beginning. So you're having someone in the family who is a writer or a great beauty or a, I don't know, a military general. <laughs> he was the mayor of a provincial town. For instance, for instance, and uh, somehow, slowly, without any visible effort, this person becomes the focal point of the whole memory landscape you are trying to traverse. So there are the interestings and the non-interestings, and you are always supposed to be choosing, right? Uh, I mean, I am a keen reader of uh, different biographies, and I was spotting it even in my own reading, reading trajectories. Uh, Okay, you want to read uh, about your Pauitzelan or your T.S. Eliot, and so you're quickly going across the first four chapters dealing with his parents, grandparents, with his background, because they didn't write a thing, right? Uh, mm, they did not do anything interesting, but they were living, I think they suppose their lives were quite intense, then they died, but we are, I am, struggling to move forward to the story that feels more intense. And I'm deeply, uh, I'm deeply against this concept. I think that it is a moral duty of sorts to find a way not to, not to establish this uh, hierarchy of preferences when you're writing about the past. Because every person, every living being, every, I would say every object that belonged to the past has a right for some space in our imagination. So I was trying to be fair 
and to find a fair way of opposing this idea of interesting, non-interesting, privileged, not so privileged, heroic, totally unheroic people and objects. And that's why, again, this book doesn't have a defined plot. It tells, well, a number of stories, multiple stories, the stories of my relatives and the parallel stories of different people, some of them artists, some of them not, who were experiencing the same, well, the same historical... Uh, mm, mm. The same Russian century. Yes, or, but it's yeah. not even exclusively Russian. Yeah, it's the it's same European uh, 20th century. Well, you mentioned being a reader of biographies. You're also clearly a reader of autobiographies. And, and I wonder, because we've had conversations about this um, anecdotally, um, we've talked since there was recently the um, exhibition here about um, Stein and Picasso, and that led us to discuss the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, which, which you had read and you have an interesting story about a particular edition of that. Um, also very recently I read an essay of yours about uh, the autobiography of Nadezhda Mandelstam, who is the wife of one of the great 20th century Russian poets. And so this autobiography is partly belongs to this kind of genre of literary widow, um, which is to say, you know, an account of, of the great writer in the family, but it is also um, a narrative um, of, 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 of importance. Um, and uh, we've also, there's a section of this book um, that is devoted to the 20th century Jewish-German artist and writer Charlotte Salomon, these are just three different kinds of examples, different forms of autobiography that you've engaged with, in, um, I presume, parallel to the writing of this text. Um, can you say something about that reading about the way that others have fashioned their own lives in writing and whether or not your, the question of voice, narrative voice in this text is in any way responds to that or, or simply um, is, um, can be separated from, from other forms of reading? Hmm. Well, to, to, an to answer this question, it would take me writing another book. <laughs> because, well, uh, that's, that's, that's huge. Uh, but um, to make it more banal, could you say something about some of the autobiographical texts that you read? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I, I'll try to. Um, and uh, year by year, I am becoming more and more of a reader of different uh, non-fiction genres, uh, which is which is interesting. This slow, unconscious drifting from the invented stories and imaginary characters to the stories and characters that, of course, are also invented because, uh, you know, the narrator is always lying or, well, pretending not to lie, but still, but still, well, changing things. Uh, Fictioneering. Fiction, exactly, exactly. Uh, but still, uh, but still there, uh, there is a difference and I don't think it is only my own case. I think that we are witnessing a significant turn of the reader's attitude that makes a wider, the, the wider audiences switch from the novels in general to something else. And mainly, I could say that uh, the books I love and the books that, that I'm reacting on uh, it is always hard to, to, to find the right definition for them. For instance, well, uh, Maggie Nelson, The Bluets, or The Red Parts. What is that? Is it poetry? Is it in a way? It is, well, The Bluets are an essay book, but also with some autobiographical bits and pieces and it becomes even more interesting with the Argonauts or with the red parts because there is a story, but it is a beautiful essay writing as well, 
and no one could tell me that it is not poetry, even when she is quoting a, a trial case document. So it is getting harder and harder to, well, I wouldn't like to be a prize jury member because how, how you're supposed to know is this thing a novel or a book of poems. But what is interesting to me, I think that we're living in the times when uh, something, well, big that I'm calling for myself memory literature in its different manifestations is becoming more and more important. And I would say that the interest towards this uh, line of writing that you cannot exactly describe, and even the quality of writing is not so important nowadays. It is conveying a certain message. It is not being afraid of repetitions. It is trans, translingual, transgenerational, transcultural uh, in a sense. And uh, the common denominator is this deep obsession with the past that, uh, that makes us uh, look more with a world with more of interest uh, uh, into the lives of our parents or grandparents, into the street landscape, into the shop signs of the 1960s or 1930s. And they are much more of these, these uh, impressions that we never received firsthand are somehow becoming more vivid and more interesting they are defining our lives more, much more than our own impressions and memories. And that's a strange reversal that has a number of political implications we're not going to, 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 to together, but um, it's, uh, uh, it is uh, kind of problematic politically. But it is the reality that we have to face, I suppose. Uh, autobiographical, uh, autobiographical and biographical genres are also transforming themselves into something deeper, into they are well, building a platform that is horizontal. It does not have this logic of preferences. And uh, for me, it is uh, well endlessly interesting, to say the least. Right, and fruitful, I would think, too, from a creative standpoint. Um, this is the first point at which I'd like to ostensibly break away from the conversation about me in memory of memory um, and do something that is probably verboten, which is to say talk about a work in progress. But um, you're writing, uh, well, we don't know what it is. It's, it's some unclassifiable genre um, of prose. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it's it's it, in some ways it sounds as though, um, as with this book, there's a combination of documentation that is historical in its orientation, and um, with a sensibility that belongs to a fiction writer, a storyteller, of trying to assemble the different parts. Um, could you say something about this 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 work in progress? Um, partly because I'm very interested also about this relationship that you've been discussing um, between the so-called fictional and non-fictional and the border between them. Uh, well, maybe maybe it is. Well, maybe the uh, the time has come for for a, for a full disclosure because uh, well, I was um, I I don't really like to be speaking much of uh, something that I'm writing presently. But in this case, I've been writing, well, working with this book or, well, thinking about this book since the, uh, the late 2019th. So I've started before the pandemic. And the book and the research were keeping me company throughout the pandemic years and then through, well, after the Russia's full-scale invasion into Ukraine. Uh, well, it sort of followed me into well, from, from Russia, or maybe I was following this story, it is hard to say. I was writing it, uh, dropping it, writing it again, and now it is slowly coming to conclusion. And um, it is uh, even more curious for me because it is a documentary novel 
that is dealing with the first half of the 19th century, uh, well, the 1810s, 18, early 1840s, uh, and that's a British story. It is a story of a British diarist, that uh, female person who was uh, an obsessive traveler. And her last travel, the one she was dreaming about for, for decades, was making it to Russia, to the Russian Empire. And she was traveling through, throughout Russia for a year and a half and died tragically in, in uh, the land that is now Georgia in uh, 1840. And I was able to work with her travel notebooks in her family archive, and I was following the story. And obviously, well, I'm, as you can see, I am far from being British. And uh, the, uh, if I have a field, I'm not an academic, an academic but uh, well, I know a couple of things about the Russian 20th century and the Russian literature of the 1920s, 1930s. So it was a bit of a terrain incognita for me, but still I was obsessed with the person, with her strange, peculiar sensibility, and with her highly contemporary uh, longing to be everything at the same time, to be everything, to do everything, to cover all the possible bases. Uh, in the British society of uh, well, early Victorian age, that was quite, quite a tricky approach. She was a mountain climber, she was an obsessive uh, anatomist, and uh, as I started uh, telling you, she was living here in Paris and studying with Cuvier, and as a female person was not able to, she was not allowed to dissect in together with men. So she was having body parts and little corpses. Uh, sorry for the macabre details, but I think it is, um, it is giving you a bit of a context and a certain kind of a contemporary feel. So she was uh, having these body parts sent into her studio at Rio San Victor, uh, so she would be able to dissect in private. She was an autodidact, an obsessive reader, well, she was lots of things. And uh, what was interesting to me is, again, putting, well, solving the puzzle, putting the things together. Because if you are regarding her as this bare, solitary figure, she is a bit larger than life. She is a bit terrifying. This super, this super power, powerhouse, a person who is able to do anything unstoppable, uh, grand, and unprecedented. And what I wanted to understand is where does she actually come from? And when you're digging deeper into the 18th century, the precedents, the possible examples she could be using. You're suddenly understanding that she was not a, a lonely time traveler from the 21st century. There is a story behind the story. And I was trying to put all that together and also to tell a bit of my own story, maybe because lots of things she was going through sort of ring the bell for me as well. well it feels um, necessary, given that we're here with, with, with one of the most prominent and important poets of Russian today, to hear a little bit of your poetry, to move into another genre, if that's OK, although they can, of course, mix. Um, and in fact, also one of the books for sale is is a collection of poems by Maria Stepanova. So I've asked her to um, select a poem to read, and uh, and she'll read it in the original, and I'll read it in the English. Should I read the English translation first, perhaps? Yes. Yeah, so that you have everybody has a kind of yeah, framework.
So this is from um, the volume uh, that was published by Columbia University Press called The Voiceover. Summarized, what was said amounted to, she simply isn't able to speak for herself, so she is always ruled by others. Because her history repeats and repeats itself, takes on erzatz and out-of-date date forms, and there is no knowing where her quotes are from, 1930 or 1970. They're all in there, pell-mell, all at once. Not to remind us, you understand, just to plug the holes. Appalling, really. Her raw material, her diamonds, her dust tracks, her dirt-colored trailers, ancient forests, mountain ranges, snow leopards, desert roses, gas flow, needed for global trade arrangements. Her raw material doesn't want to do business with her, gives itself up without love, will do as she wants. Unclear what she needs. Where's your eye? Where is it hidden? Why do strangers speak for you? Or are you speaking in the voices of scolds and cowards? Get out of yourself. Put that dictionary back on the shelf. She won't come out. It won't come right. Look how fairy fleet she is. See her wings in aeroplanchon, wool scouring, steel beating, pasteurizing, thousand-eyed, thousand-bricked civic expansion weavers singing at their non-functioning looms. Voluntary wine drinking zones, soup, forgive my French, Matistes striding forth, Junker lords, Kalashnikovs, Bolsh oh, Bolshoi, ba <laughs> Bolshoi ballet dancing out from behind the fire curtain, the fenced in ghost of a murdered orchard, orchard. This fucking country, paradise sleeping in hell's embrace. Thank you so much, and uh, maybe uh, here we also need a bit of uh, context. Uh, this this uh, this poem is a part of a poetry sequence that was written after the Russia's war against Ukraine actually had started in tw 2014, and I was trying to to explain myself to put my finger on what was actually going on with the language how the language is changing after the actual violence is, well, being reawakened. And um, I was trying to, to, to dig deeper into, well, the contemporary Russia's obsession with memory, with quotation, with, uh, with its own uh, glorious or not so glorious, cultural and political past with never-ending satisfaction. And uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, just a part of this uh, long sequence. The title is Spolia, you know, this Roman architectural mode of building a, building a, mm, building a house or a church, building, uh, b building something. Uh, using the remnants of previous buildings that were destroyed or demolished. So you are able to have a, um, an uh, building from, uh, from the fifth century uh, after Christ. Uh, and you see that the stones, the, 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 the marble slabs, the uh, remnants of uh, columns, are used as building material, as if, as well, as hidden quotations in the poetic text. And I was trying to apply the same method, or maybe to use the same mindset while writing this book. And uh, uh, you, what, you were, what you were hearing was a beautiful translation uh, by Sasha Dugdale, and uh, that's how the Russian original sounds. Если собрать в точку, было сказано вот что. Она не способна говорить за себя, поэтому ею всегда правят другие, потому в ее истории столько повторов и фальсифицируются отжившие формы, и не понять, откуда какая цитата 
из 30-го или 70-го года, потому что она цитирует все одновременно, и не чтобы напомнить, а чтобы наполнить дыры, что особенно жутко. Ее материал, ее мазы, алмазы, каменные пещеры, древесные леса, золотые горы, снежные барса, пустынные розы, газовые потоки, которые так нужны мировой торговле, ее материал не хочет иметь с ней дело, дает без любви делать с собой, что надо, непонятно, чего ей надо. Где твое я? Почему его не видно? Почему за тебя говорят посторонние люди? Или ты говоришь голосами шутих и трусов, выйди из себя, поставь этот словарь на полку? Она не выходит. Это у нее не выходит. Вот ее огромные пароходства, ширококрылые самолетства, шерстобитные сталилитейные молочные производства, многоокие градостроительные предприятия, ткачихи, поющие над неработающими станками, зоны вольного винопития, супри, прости господи, матические открытия, господа юнкера, автомат калашников, большой балет, вытанцовывающий из загашников за решеткою, призрак убитого летнего сада. Это страна, рай, уснувший в объятиях ада. And it's remarkable and striking, um, even just while listening to the poem and, and, and looking at the translation, the imbrication of your themes across these many years and these different genres. And it's, it's almost equally depressing to think about um, uh, what hasn't changed uh, in the meantime and, and the way that um, uh, this examination of the past um, throws up so much that uh, remains relevant um, in the immediate present. Um, it's kind of haunting um, to have that. Um, Thank you. We do have time for questions. I don't want to monopolize the conversation here. So if somebody does have a question, there's a microphone. Perhaps you can indicate. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much. Uh, especially that ending was very beautiful. Um, maybe you don't want to talk about this more, but uh, with regards to the thing that you're working on now, I'd love to hear you say more about perhaps the responsibilities or the honesties um, of writing about someone's life, especially when someone's life leaves us the, these kind of amazing traces or evidences that can perhaps build larger political or historical um, arguments or motivations. Uh, and, and Daniel, you mentioned also uh, Toklas and Stein and uh, Janet Malcolm, their biographer, has this like really good essay um, on Sylvia Plath. Um, where she's kind of, as always, quite bitingly honest about the, the act of writing about someone's life. So I'd love to hear your kind of opinion on that. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful question. And uh, it is really something that I've been, well, uh, that I'm haunted with for, for, for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, actually, it, it also comes uh, uh, to writing about your own life. You remember there is another Janet Malcolm's essay on writing autobiography where she's trying to apply the same principles to the challenge of autobiography writing. And uh, we know that she didn't finish her autobiography and it was sort of combined, put together after her death. Uh, but I don't think there is a real difference uh, uh, in, in your approach, in one's approach, when you're writing about a prominent person, about an interesting person, and about a not so famous or well, so-called ordinary being. Because, well, uh, the, the easy example that, uh, that I've been dealing with is my own family. Uh, which is a family of non-interestings, exemplary non-interestings. Uh, because in the Russian 20th century, uh, maybe your main goal was 
to stay unnoticed in order to stay alive. So they were consciously pushing themselves out to the margins for more than 70 years. And when it becomes a custom, uh, you are, I think you are suddenly starting to enjoy your anonymity, your uh, seemingly, your being that seemingly doesn't have any, well, doesn't leave any traces. You start to enjoy it, you know, hiding in the shadows. Uh, the phrase, the shadows, as uh, Tanizaki puts it. So, uh, the question is, if someone, if someone is uh, obviously preferring to stay in the shadow, are you, is it a moral thing? Is it ethically permitted to uh, disclose this, the, the, these people's we're about to give details, to tell the stories? Uh, we have, for the last 30 or 40 years, maybe from the 80s, we have this notion that uh, bringing people into the spotlight is something that we're supposed to applaud. We are bringing back to life the forgotten stories, the vanished uh, names. And no one is asking themselves if these people would love to be resurrected, if they would like to be noticed, to be written about. And uh, I don't have any solution. I don't have any answer that would be, that I would find, uh, well, working, effective, even for myself. Because I, kn and of course, when, when it comes to working, to writing about the, the dead people, we have no way of asking them if they would be approving of our easygoing attitude uh, about telling all the stories. And, uh, well, I doubt it. And still, well, I've uh, written some, well, few hundreds of pages about my, uh, my relatives. And these pages include uh, some love letters, some uh, post-up notes, some things that uh, were obviously meant for personal use only. And so I think that there is one more impossibility we're supposed to be facing. On one hand, uh, we have this almost biologic inbuilt urge to be telling the story because that's uh, an only secular way of prolonging other people's lives. We want them to stay with us for, for, for a while and we never ask them what would they prefer. And if they told us, uh, I wonder, I mean, there is something eerie about, about the way human rights are ending the very moment a person is passing away. Uh, a couple of years uh, until the rights the, uh, the are, are still valid. But after that, I mean, 10 or 20 years after the person dies, and everyone can do anything about her legacy. Uh, to write a novel, to write an, uh, well, erotic comic strip, I mean, anything. And um, I really think that what we need is a declaration of rights for the dead. Some kind of a, some kind of a set of rules uh, that would allow us not to feel so guilty any time we're, we're trying to approach uh, other people's lives without thinking that the same could happen to us as well. And well, <laughs> so, well, we're definitely going to die. And uh, who knows, well, you know, one of the things that, that I'm still coming back to in my mind, I was uh, at a railway station in Berlin and they were selling a huge album of the old school uh, erotic, well, actually pornographic photography, uh, the Tashin edition, some 700 pages, uh, with, well, I had to write a poetry sequence about that. It, it's a, another story, we don't have time for that. But the one thing I want to tell you about, it was a slogan on the, on the, mm, on the first, uh, no, on the back flap. Uh, 
Look, maybe you'll find your great-grandmother at these pages. And uh, it doesn't mean so much to me if it is my great-grandmother. But when it comes to the sex workers of the late 19th century, it is they were not well off, right? So it is highly likely that this image of a person who is, uh, well, who was filmed in this very unnatural body position, uh, doing something, well, unspeakable, or not so unspeakable, whatever, uh, naked, uh, exposed, overexposed, uh, maybe it is the only image of this person that remains and that is how we are going to remember her. And can we do anything, something to restore her dignity? What is the way of dealing with that? And I think that's the moment where art and literature are supposed to enter the scene because we cannot unsee what we've seen. We cannot uh, find another photograph of the same person because it doesn't exist. But maybe we can do something. You know, this uh, instinctive gesture of covering her body, making her face more visible, this uh, well, way of uh, releasing her because, well, they feel so trapped in this, in this book. Yes. We have time for one final question. Um, I'll go over here. I'm sorry I'm talking too much. No, please don't apologize. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a bit about how your uh, writing has changed or the way you see yourself as a writer since you left Russia. It seems like a significant moment. Um, um, whether it's, I, I, I think you've continued to write in Russian, but whether um, you know either the genre or the way you approach your writing has changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm asking myself this question a lot. So, of course, I write in Russian, it is my mother tongue, and uh, uh, I don't have another language to switch to. to s mm. But, um, well, and I am writing, uh, but uh, mainly prose or essays, which is, which is weird because I don't really endorse the idea of this necessity of living at your own soil to be connected with the everyday language, whatever. And uh, I am not uh, a teenager anymore, so I think I do remember my Russian well enough not to be afraid of that. But there is another thing, and it prevents me from writing poetry, or at least from publishing poetry. I did write a sequence uh, the last year that was trying to deal with the realities of the last year of the full-scale invasion and and all the guilt and shame and mm, of well of uh, still living living on in these circumstances but um, it is still unfinished uh, and uh, I don't know if or when or how I would be able to finish it because for, well, for putting a final poem into the sequence or a final dot after this poem, I'll need to feel that the situation has changed and it didn't. We we've entered this never-ending corridor of stasis and we don't know if we're going to land or when we're going to land. So, and I am very much aware that the language, the uzus, as well as the everyday speech has been changing for these months. Uh, there is a lot of neologisms, inventions that are coming, springing to life, smelling with blood. And uh, also, you're suddenly opening, your, your, your eyes are opening to the fact that Basically, in the Russian language, like the hidden landmines, there is a lot of coiled metaphors, coiled, uh, coiled uh, um, um, turns of phrase that you've never noticed before, but now they are imbued with, with 
meaning that is bringing well you closer and closer to the point of someone else's death and it is a stupefying knowledge and i never imagined that it is well it goes so close it gets so close to give you an example well um and and i don't uh, what uh, i i want to, to to make it clear i don't think it is a specific a specific thing about the Russian language. I think this potential for hidden violence that is waiting to come over to come to the sur uh, to, to come to the surface. Uh, it is um, it is a um, necessary part of any developed language. But as we are as it is happening in Russia with Russia nowadays, so a person is sending another person uh, an email saying stop bombarding me with letters and now you are just getting frozen at this moment because well it is not us who are being bombed it is us i mean people who are well holding the same passport belonging to the same society people who i was sharing the living space with they are doing the actual bombing. So a number of layers, a number of jokes, a number of metaphors are, is becoming totally, utterly impossible. And uh, language as it is, is a fabric of connections. It is a texture where everything is intertwined. So you are unable to use just one register without activating another. And so, uh, it is different with prose because you are just getting carried away with someone else's lives, and it is it is it saves uh, it saves my life actually because I am able to well to dive into this other reality, but it is different with poetry. <laughs>